The Aztec had found their island paradise. They built a temple to their god Huitzilopochtli, and they celebrated. But the good times were not to last. The Aztec had bigger issues to contend with. Their capital of Tenochtitlan was located between three larger kingdoms. To the east was the kingdom of Texcoco. To the south were the Culhuacan, whom the Aztec had just escaped from after murdering a princess. And to the west was the kingdom of Azcapotzalco. Each of these kingdoms controlled several cities and towns, while the Aztec only controlled a small amount of people in a small town located on a small island. The Aztec fully understood that they did not possess the economic, military or political resources to stand up against any of these larger kingdoms. And so the Aztec decided to lay low until such a time that they could claim the land that was theirs by the will of Huitzilopochtli. The Aztec people became hunters, gatherers and farmers, eventually developing enough to warrant traveling to neighboring towns to trade raw materials in exchange for manufactured goods and other raw materials that were not available to them. But as they traded, they gained the unwanted attention of those same towns. You see, these towns were part of the kingdom of Azcapotzalco, and these towns were being taxed in exchange for protection. But now, here was a group of people who had recently settled an island, benefiting from the safe trade provided by the kingdom of Azcapotzalco, and yet paid no taxes. This seemed unfair to many, and so the king of Azcapotzalco implemented heavy taxes on the Aztec. But the Aztecs, realizing their inferiority, decided to be diplomatic and sent a committee to treat with the king, to plead with him for lower taxes. To the king, however, these were people who settled one of his islands, who had traded without paying taxes, and who had now dared to ask him to lower taxes. So he increased taxes even further. These taxes would take such a heavy toll on the Aztec that even the nobility had trouble getting enough to eat. Knowing that military action wasn't an option, the Aztec begrudgingly decided to pay these heavy taxes, becoming a tributary town of the Kingdom of Azcapotzalco. But this humiliation also made something blatantly clear to the Aztec. They needed to drastically modernize their political system in order to keep up with their neighbors. Tribalism simply wouldn't do anymore. And so they took over the feudalistic system that their neighbors used, with a king at the top, a council of nobles who would rule large parts of territory, and lesser nobles ruling small areas. But who should be the king? Well, before they knew who should be the king, they asked themselves what a good king should be like. And the answer to this question was rather simple. A good king should be the embodiment of Huitzilopochtli on earth. Strong, intelligent, and most of all, a good warrior. And these criteria would stay mostly the same for their entire history. As we saw in the beginning with the great migration of the Aztec, they had evolved from a religious and agricultural society into a militaristic society. And this hadn't changed. The Aztec were still warlike and served in the armies of their Azcapotzalco overlords. So when they had to choose a king, they didn't choose him based on his skill in politics or economics. They chose him based on their skill in battle. And as we will see later on, this meant that the Aztec kings would often resolve problems with military thinking instead of using political savviness, intelligence networks, or economic skills. And their search came to an end when they heard of a man called Akamapichtli, who the Aztecs believed embodied all the great traits a ruler should have, and invited him to become their king. And so, in 1375, the Aztec tribe became the Aztec kingdom. King Akamapichtli is said to have ruled his kingdom effectively, and he is mainly credited for his domestic policies. It is under his reign that the town of Tenochtitlan was turned into a proper city, with temples, parks, wide open streets, residential areas, canals, and even new land added to their island. The kingdom enjoyed a period of peace and growth, but as the king grew older, however, he realized that he would die soon. The Aztec needed a successor to the throne, but how do you choose a successor? Do you handpick them? Do you let them fight it out between them in a bloody civil war? Do you simply choose your eldest son by tradition? Akamapichli's answer to this question was a very odd one for a monarch. He decided that the people of Tenochtitlan would choose his successor in an election. 
the people would get to vote on which of his seven true-born children would succeed him as king. He also had one bastard son, but we will get to him later. This election set a precedent, for unlike many European or Asian monarchies, the successor of the Aztec was often chosen by the Aztecs. While this is the only public election the Aztec ever had to settle the matter of succession, from now on, the council of nobles who served the king would be the ones who would choose which of the king's relatives would succeed him. And again, they usually chose a military leader as their king rather than someone who is trained to be a king. And so too in this election, the people had chosen the best warrior as their next leader. And continuing that tradition of unpronounceable names, their next king was named Huitzilihuitl. What? Huitzilihuitl. Their next king was named Huitzilihuitl. Huitzilihuitl's contribution were mostly political and continued many of the policies of his father. After decades of the same policy of laying low, paying taxes, and forging alliances, it finally bore fruit. Upon the advice of the Aztec council, Huitzilihuitl went to the king of Azcapotzalco to ask to marry one of his daughters in a political alliance. The royal council of Azcapotzalco was against this marriage, realizing that this was merely a political move to request concessions from the king through his daughter. Nevertheless, the king agreed to this marriage, and just as the Azcapotzalco council had feared, on the wedding day, the new Aztec queen asked her father to reduce the heavy tax burden on the Aztec. And so, through marriage, King Huitzilihuitl finally managed to eliminate many of the heavy taxes his people were forced to pay. The Aztec were now finally free from this burden and able to grow much faster. In his later years, however, their Azcapotzalco overlord went to war against several of the neighboring kingdoms. And as you may recall, the Aztec had been waging war ever since they got to this part of the world. So the Aztec joined the army of their overlords and helped to expand the Azcapotzalco kingdom by conquering Tatscoco and Colhuacan. But in the middle of these wars, King Huitzilihuitl passed away in 1417. He was succeeded by his son, Chimalpopoca. At the age of 20, King Chimalpopoca lacked both experience and useful advice. He was completely subjugated to the interests of the council. The most important thing he did, however, was being the grandson of the king of Azcapotzalco. You see, his grandfather doted on the young Aztec king, and the Aztec council made good use of this weakness. They continually told Chimalpopoca to go to his grandfather to ask for favors. You see, Mesoamerican politics revolved around favors and tribute. Friends and allies would grant each other favors, be it food, laborers, or resources but overlords would demand that as tribute from their vassals. And so, being the vassal, the Aztec requested favors from their overlords. But with every request, the Aztec council grew more bold. After all, Chimalpopoca was the favorite grandson. But the Aztec council forgot to take into account the power of the Azapotzalco council. For the council of Azapotzalco was extremely upset that special favors were being granted to the Aztec. The Aztec was seemingly less and less like a vassal, and more and more like a potential rival. This all came to a boiling point when the Aztecs requested that Azcapotzalco send the men and materials to build an aqueduct to Tenochtitlan. This was something an overlord would demand from their vassals, not something a vassal would request from their overlord. And so the Council of Azcapotzalco concluded that war was inevitable. Their king, however, tried to prevent war, going as far as to plead with the council to spare his beloved grandson. But the council had made up its mind. The Aztec kingdom must be subservient, the Aztec people must pay taxes, and the Aztec king must die. And according to the official record, upon hearing of the final verdict, the old king died of anguish. While there is no proof that he was murdered, the timing of his death is very convenient. So take that as you will. The Council of Azcapotzalco needed to eliminate the Aztec threat. They decided against open warfare and instead opted for a sharp knife. Assassins sneaked into the palace of the Aztec king Chimalpopoca and murdered him in his sleep. But they didn't stop there. They murdered almost the entire royal family, leaving the Aztec in a state of leaderless panic. Without a strong leader, they would surely lose this war. 
and so the Aztec once again looked for a strong leader to lead them in their war of independence. And so they looked for a man who was a strong general and of royal blood. They found these qualities in a man named Itzcoatl, the bastard son of the first Aztec king and the only royal family member who could take on this great burden. And so, in 1426, he was crowned King Itzcoatl. He first sent a messenger asking for peace, but that was refused. The Aztec would need to fight, but they couldn't do this alone. They were but one city in a large kingdom which they had helped to forge. So they turned towards the allies that they had made and emphasized how terrible the Azcapotzalco were treating them. They first made an alliance with the city of Texcoco. Texcoco was located on the other side of the lake that separated them from the rest of the Azcapotzalco territory. And so they quickly conquered the remaining lands Azcapotzalco controlled on their side of the lake. The Aztec, meanwhile, conquered the lands north of Tenochtitlan. And upon hearing of these victories, a third city decided to join the rebellion. The people of Tlacopan had suffered for too long under the tyranny of Azapotzalco and joined Tenochtitlan and Texcoco in a desperate war of liberation. Together, they formed the Triple Alliance, a strong military, political and economic coalition that would be the origin of what would eventually become the Aztec Empire. The Triple Alliance met the army of Azapotzalco in open battle. Fighting fanatically and quickly overpowering their enemy, King Itzcoatl followed the enemy into the city of Azapotzalco, which served as the capital. The Aztec invaded the city, murdered the majority of the population, and ordered the city to be burned to the ground. The Aztec had finally gained their independence. Azapotzalco was no more, and the Aztec were finally free. If you like this video, then please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. My next video will continue the story of the Aztec Empire, and then I'll take a short break and talk about the history of ozone depletion and how it was being fought. If you want to see those and other videos as soon as they come out, press the subscribe button.